Great to see everybody here this morning. I have a card, and I want to read this before I get into the lesson today. Dear family, I cannot thank you all enough for the blessings I received at my wedding shower on Saturday. Thank you to all who attended, and a special thank you to Annie, Jeanette, Christy, Julie Moore, Becky, and Julie Stoltz. It takes a village, and I am thankful for all of the women at Central who have given me support and love since I came here over the last 10 years. I love you all so much. Love, Brianna Hall. And I'll post this out in the foyer. All right, well, for those of you who are visiting with us today, as you guys can see, we're in a series entitled One Another. And what we're doing in this series is we're just simply looking at several of the one another passages that we find in the Bible. And we've already looked at several so far. For example, in John chapter 13, we talked about how Jesus said that we are to love one another. In week number two, we looked at Ephesians chapter 4 where Paul says that we are to forgive one another. In Hebrews chapter 10, the Hebrew writer writes about how we are to encourage one another. In Romans chapter 14, we looked at how we're to accept one another. And then last week from Galatians chapter 6, we talked about how we are to bear with one another. Now, if you missed any of those lessons, again, we want to encourage you to get a copy of those for free on CD or you can go to our webpage, whcentral.church, and you can watch any of those lessons off of there anytime you'd like as well. But today we're going to look at our last one another passage. And really, to kind of lead into this, I want to tell you guys a story. There was an, an elderly lady who was at a busy intersection downtown. And she was very fearful. I mean, the cars were just whizzing by and she, did, she needed to cross and she didn't really know what she was going to do when all of a sudden a young man came up and he took her by the arm. And he asked her, he said, can I cross with you? And, and of course, with, with her fear and, and just needing help, she said, yes, absolutely. And so the two of them, they stepped out onto the busy intersection together. And cars were just whizzing by and they were zigging and they were zagging and, and they were nearly hit three times. And when they got to the other side, the elderly lady was just absolutely furious. She says, are you crazy? We were nearly killed. She said, you walk like someone who is blind. And he said, I am blind. He said, that's why I asked, can I cross with you? Now I told you that story to lead into this question. What are you looking for in a church? What are you looking for in a family? Are you looking for a place where you can go and you can be served? Or are you looking for a place for a people where you can go and serve them? What are you looking for? Let me remind you of what Paul says in Galatians 5, 13 through 14. This is our, our next one another passage. Notice what he says at the beginning, church. What does he say? Serve, Serve one another in love for the whole law. And it seems like we've seen this before, right? For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so notice what Paul says. Paul says, I want you to serve one another, but that's not all he says, right? He says, I want you to serve in what? I want you to serve in love. From the very beginning of this series, we have said that love is the foundation for everything in this series that we've been talking about. Whether it's forgiveness, whether it's encouragement, 
whether it's acceptance or bearing with one another, or today as we talk about serving one another, listen to me this morning, write this down and remember it, love has got to be the foundation of everything that we do. That's important. In fact, the other night I was doing the devotional for our family and I was sitting around and, and I told my kids, I said, listen, I said, you know, we're not even going to discuss this tonight. I just want to read it and I want you to just meditate on it. I want you to just think about the words that I'm reading. This is what I read. 1 Corinthians 13, if I could speak in any language in heaven or on earth but didn't love others, he says, I would be only making meaningless noise like a loud gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I knew all the mysteries of the future and knew everything about everything, he says, but didn't love others, what good would it be? And if I had the gift of faith, so that I could speak to a mountain and make it move. Without love, I would be no good to anybody. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, it would be of no value whatsoever. Do you hear what Paul is writing? Everything that we do has got to have a foundation laid through love. Now some of you may be thinking, well, why is love so important? I mean, Jesus here, He says in John 13, 34 through 35, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I've loved you. And so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, Jesus is hammering this home. On one occasion he was asked, what is the greatest command? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. Love your neighbors as yourself. And it's just like, why so much about love? Why is it so important? Well, first of all, we will make a huge impact on the world when we do people better than anyone else. Are you with me? When we forgive, when we encourage, when we are people who accept others and we bear burdens and when we serve others, listen, when we truly show the love of Christ to others, it makes a huge impact on this world. In fact, Jesus says, that's how people will know that you are my disciple. It's not the fact that you may bring a Bible to work. It's not the fact that you may have a Jesus sticker on the back of your car. It's not the fact that you wear jewelry with a cross on it and there's nothing. Listen, there's nothing wrong with any of that stuff. But Jesus says, if you want to really show the world, if you want to make a huge impact for me, He says, then love others as I have loved you. And that's what this series is all about. That's what it takes to forgive. That's what it takes to serve. Everything we do has to be done through love. But also, let me add this to it. It makes one anothering a whole lot easier. When we do these things that we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks, when we do them through love, it makes things so much easier, doesn't it? rather than doing them out of obligation or duty or guilt. Well, well, this is what Jesus told me to do, and so I better do it. This is what Slate preached on last week, and so I guess I better go out and... Let me give you an example of this. Several years ago, when we lived in Alabama, Julie's Aunt Sally stopped by our house. It was a surprise visit. And she brought Christmas gifts. And she said, Julie, she said, I was unable to go to your mom and dad's this year for Christmas. And so she said, the next time you guys go up there, would you take these gifts to your mom and dad? And Julie said, yeah, absolutely. And then she whips out gifts for our entire family. And Julie sees this and she goes, oh, wow, thank you. 
And I can see, man, the wheels are already turning. And, and, and before I knew it, Julie said, listen, your gifts are not wrapped, and so let me go upstairs and get your gifts. And so my wife disappears. And I'm sitting there for a while, and I'm talking to Aunt Sally, and then down comes my wife with presents for Aunt Sally and Uncle Henry. And Aunt Sally decides she's going to open her present right there. And so she opens it up, and it's a pair of earrings. And Aunt Sally looks at the earrings, and she goes, Oh, she says, thank you. And she closes up the box, and we talk just a few more minutes, and then she leaves. And after she leaves, I look at Julie, and I said, Julie, I said, I had no idea we got gifts for Aunt Sally and Uncle Henry this year. And Julie said, well, actually, so this is what I did. I went upstairs. I started looking for stuff that they might like that we have. And she said, I found a brand new pair of earrings that I had never worn before. And she said, they look just like something Aunt Sally would wear. And I took those earrings and I, I wrapped it up and I got something for Uncle Henry and wrapped his up. And then all of a sudden she stopped and she goes, oh, no. And I was like, what? She said, those earrings, I know why they look like Aunt Sally. <laughs> and I said, why? She said, because she gave me those earrings a couple of years back. <laughs> Obligation. She felt obligated to give them something because they had given us something. Out of guilt, it was like, man, this is, you know, this is what you're supposed to do when someone gives you something. And so she put together some gifts very quickly. But let me tell you about another gift that Julie gave. Julie spent hours one Christmas going through albums and pictures of her and her dad. And man, she was just so excited about it. She put this big collage together and she wrapped it up and she was just so excited to give it to her dad and she gave it to her dad. And when he opened it up and saw the pictures of him and her, man, she, he just began crying and she began crying and they were, they were reliving these memories and, and the gift was so special. And I'll tell you why, because it wasn't something that she gave out of obligation. It was something that she gave from her heart. And you look at what Paul says here. He says, we are to serve one another. And we're to do it with our heart. We're to do it through love. And it's amazing how different that process is. And how easier it is for us to do the things that we've been talking about when we truly love that individual that we're doing it to. But let me share a few more things with you about serving others that we've got to understand. As we serve one another... First of all, we have to understand that our service is essential to the body. I'm going to say this twice because I think this is so important. I think we miss this oftentimes. Listen to me. One of the reasons that God saved you, okay, you listen to me, was so that His church could experience the benefit of you belonging to it. Let me say that again. One of the reasons that God saved you was so that His church could experience the benefit of you belonging to it. 1 Corinthians 12, 12-18, this is what Paul writes, The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. We understand the body, right? We have a lot of parts, but they all make up one body. Well, he makes this spiritual as well. He says, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized when, by one Spirit into one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, and we were all given one Spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. 
If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. And if an ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not, for that reason, cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as He wanted them to be. Notice why Paul says, God has called you into the body to serve in the role that He has designed specifically for you. Isn't that awesome? Which What that tells us is, is this. There is no unimportant parts in the body of Christ. None. It doesn't matter if you're a teenager or if, if you're somewhere up in your 80s or, or 90s. There are no unimportant parts of the body. And I think one of the things that would help us to really understand this, if we had a clear understanding of the New Testament concept of membership. We talk about membership. We ask people about their membership. Where, where are you a member at? Where is your membership? And the word member is definitely in the New Testament. It's used many times, but not how we oftentimes use it today. When we use the term membership today, it's like we're talking about joining a club or an organization. What does it take to be a part of a club or an organization? What does it take to be a good member? Well, typically, to be a good member of a club or an organization, first of all, pay your dues on time. Second of all, show up at least every now and then to some meetings. And then thirdly, don't embarrass, don't do anything that would embarrass the club or the organization or, or the people in the group. And, and basically, that's what it takes to be a good member. But a body is different from an organization. Because we count on a 100% commitment of every member of our body. Let me show you what I mean. In an organization, after you've worked, you know, after you've served for several years, you may say, you know what, I'm just going to take the summer off. But in no part could any part of my body, let's say it's my lungs, say, you know what, I've been, in, I've been breathing in for this guy for the last 43 years. I think I'm just going to take a couple of days off. <laughs> and no part could my kidneys say, you know what, 24-7, I have been you know, doing my part as the kidney since this guy was born. You know what? I think I'm just going to lay off for a, few, for a few years. No, I count on 100% commitment of every member, every part of my body. And this is the way the word member is used in the New Testament. That's why there should never be any inferiority complexes in the church because every single member matters. Every single one. You know, so oftentimes we talk about the Lord's army. As, as Christians, we're, we're a part of, of the Lord's army. How many of you were in the military? Okay, we've got several folks who are in the military. Now let me ask you, when you were in the army, when you were in the military, did they just turn you loose and say, do whatever you want to do? No, you had a specific function, right? For some of you, maybe you were a mechanic. 
For others of you, you may have worked behind a desk writing up or typing up orders. For others of you, you may, you may have been the one who was carrying a gun or, or in a tank, but you had a specific duty. That's how the military, that's how the army works. And that's how it works in the Lord's church. Everybody has a function. And every function is necessary. Secondly, our service is empowered by God. Isn't that good news? I mean, to, to me, this is some of the best news we could talk about. We, we are empowered by God. When, when we become a Christian, when we are baptized into Christ, the Bible talks about how we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, it talks about how our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But listen to me. We received a greater promise than just the gift of the Holy Spirit. We were also promised a gift from the Holy Spirit. A gift that is to be used from the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 again. This time verse 4 says there are different kinds of gifts but the same Spirit. Then down in verse 11, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And He gives them to who church? To each one. Just as He determines. And so notice what, notice what Paul says here. Each of us has a gift. Now Peter is going to... He's going to take that a little bit further. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 through 11. He says, Each of you should use whatever gift he has received to serve who? To serve others. In other words, these gifts that we receive to God, it, it, it's not about us and using these gifts on us as much as it is using these gifts that He's given us on others. Faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as if one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength, what church? God provides. So that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And so what we see here is every single one of you, all of us who are children of God, we have been given a, a gift from the Spirit and it is empowered by the Spirit. The Prime Minister of Poland was also a famous pianoist. And there was a mother who really wanted her son to hear him play so that maybe one day he would be encouraged to become a pianist. And so she got front row seats for her and her little boy. And so they show up and they sit on the front row and I don't know exactly what happened but somehow the mother got distracted and the little boy went around, went up on the stage and when they pulled the curtains back, there sat her son at the piano and he began to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Well, about that time the Prime Minister walked out to perform, saw the little boy playing Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and he walked up behind him and whispered, keep playing. And the little boy played and the Prime Minister accompanied him and together the audience was in amazement at the music the two made together. Listen to me, something like that happens in the body of Christ. The Lord comes and He takes our little bitty offerings, our service, and He empowers it and the results are far beyond what we could ever imagine. Because our service is empowered by the one who gives us the gifts. And so we don't need to use statements like, well, you know, Slay, I, I, just, don't, I just don't have a whole lot to contribute. 
I mean, I, I just don't have a, a whole lot to, to give. I mean, you know, my abilities are, are just few and, and far between. I really just don't think that someone like me could make a difference. Think about the story of the boy who brought the loaves and the fish. And Jesus took those loaves and those fish, and what did He do with it? He fed a multitude. And I'm telling you, you can bring your little contribution, your service to God, and God can take that no matter what it is, and He can use it in big ways. What I'm telling you is your gift matters. And so the question is not, do I have a gift? The question is, will I use my gift? No matter how big or, or how small. Charles Plum actually was a pilot during the Vietnam War. He flew some 75 missions before he was shot down over... Uh, I believe it was uh, north, the north portion of, of Vietnam somewhere, and he, he parachuted out of the plane, and when he landed, he was captured, and he was a POW for six years. And then after those six years, he was released, he came back to the United States, and one night he was having dinner with his wife in a restaurant when a guy came up to him and he says, are you Charles Plum? And he said, yes, I am. And the guy went on to ask, he said, did you fly missions over or off the Kitty Hawk in Vietnam? And he said, yes, I did. And he went on to say, how did you know? And the guy looked at him and he says, because I was the guy who packed your parachute. And Charles Plum said he went home that night and that's all he could think about. The fact that he didn't even know who this guy was. I mean, he was a pilot and he had this important job and, and this guy was a, just a scrub. He was, he was just the guy who packs the parachutes. But he thought to himself, if he hadn't have done his job, he said, I would have died. Listen to me, church. Whether people notice it or not, God has a parachute for you to pack. He has somewhere for you to serve, and your servant, your service is vital. It's so important. Which brings us to our last point this morning, and that is our service is expected. God's not just up there wishing that we would do something. He expects it, just like we expect our kids. You know, we, 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 you know, we want our kids to do what's right. Right, parents? But, but we don't just have that desire. We don't want, it's not that we just want them to do what's right. We expect our kids to do what is right. And our Heavenly Father expects us to serve, to be active. In fact, Jesus told a parable about some servants who were given talents by their master. Some of the servants, they invested their talents. They used their talents and when the master returned, he honored them. But Jesus went on to talk about this one servant who did nothing with his talent. In fact, he buried it. And when the master returned, he punished him. In fact, he took his talent away. And he gave it to one of the other servants. Listen, God put us here for a greater purpose than just to work and make some money so that one day we can just retire. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, this is what Paul writes. He says, For we are God's, why church? Workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do what? 
good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Do you realize that? Do you realize before you were ever born, before the foundation of this, this world was ever laid, that God, He... He thought about you and He had a very specific purpose for you. Are we working towards fulfilling that purpose? I just thought about what if I went down into the audience this morning and I were to ask you who and where you were serving? I thought about that this week. I thought for some of you, I'd probably be up there for probably two hours listening to all the ways that you serve. But then I also thought that there might be some who really wouldn't have a whole lot to say. Maybe you wouldn't be able to say anything at all. And I'm just saying to you this morning, God has a purpose for you. He's gifted you. He's empowered that gift that He's given you to, to use it, no matter what it is, to, to use it in a way that's going to bring Him glory and edify and build up His, His church. But the question is, are we going to use it? I'm going to skip Luke 7. We're, we're out of time. But I do want to say this. Christians serve because we understand grace. We understand grace. We don't serve to earn our way to heaven. We don't serve to pay off our debt. We serve because the Master saved us. God paid an incredible price so that you and I could be a part of His kingdom. And the deal is, when we serve others, we serve Him. Isn't that what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 25? He's talking about the judgment day and how the sheep and the goats are going to be separated into the sheep. He's going to say, well done, that good and faithful servant, because you, you visited me in prison and you fed me and you clothed me and you gave me water. And remember what they said? They're like, Jesus, when did we ever see you, you know, in prison and, and sick and, and needing clothes and food? And he said, when you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. Let's sing a song as we close out this morning. And the first one really stems from Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 12. During this particular day and time, people could sell themselves to people when they were in debt to help pay off their debt. But God had a law. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 12, He said, after so many years... After six years, on that seventh year, you no longer owe any debt and you're, you're no longer a slave. But notice what he says. If any of your people, Hebrew men or women, sell themselves to you and serve you for six years, in the seventh year you must let them go free. Verses 16 through 17. But if your servants say to you, I don't want to leave you because he loves you and your family and is well off with you, then take it all and push it through his earlobe into the door and he will become your servant for life. You hear what he's saying? On that seventh year, there were those who loved their master so much that they said, we just want to keep serving you. And what they would do is they would pierce their ear to let other people know that they were a servant for a lifetime to the master. Pierce my ear, O oh Lord my God, take me to your door this day. I will serve no the
your blood you ransom me now I will serve you eternally a free man I'll never be make me a servant Lord make me like you for you are a servant make me want to make me a servant do what you must do to make me a servant make me like you serve one another in love whatever we do has to be done out of love that's how God operates out of his love for you and me he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for our sins and there may be someone here today who would like to respond to that in love because of what Jesus did for you you want to serve him you want to give your life to him putting Christ on in baptism having all your sins completely washed away or it may be that there's someone here today who needs prayers maybe you need prayers to get back in the game to start serving once again maybe you you decided at one point you know I'm, I'm tired I'm burnt out I'm worn out and and maybe it's time to get back in there and say you know what I want to serve the Lord not out of obligation not out of guilt but because you love the Lord and you love other people and when we do things out of love man what an impact it makes on the world